I would like to begin this seminar on narrative design research methods and processes by reflecting upon what narrative design means and why it is important. Narrative design usually employs allegory as a means of storytelling. An allegory is a story that has another underlying meaning meant to teach us something. A classic example of an allegory is the fable of the tortoise and the hare. In her article, The Fall, the Allegorical Architectural Project as a Critical Method, Penelope Haralambidu writes about the role of literary allegory in architectural design and theory as an important alternative critical practice. She writes, allegory is a structure of thought where meaning is not grasped directly, but through metaphor that often takes the guise of narrative and storytelling. In other words, an allegory signifies an intention that requires interpretation. It invites agency in order to enhance our awareness of something that is important. The allegorical architectural project can be employed to unravel another piece of work, a site, or drawing by questioning its underlying syntax. Allegorical design reveals an analytical inclination and becomes a vehicle for criticism. To develop a research methodology for narrative design, we first need to establish a research problem or provocation and then articulate a research proposition that addresses that problem or provocation. The narrative methodology will vary depending on the discipline and on the research problem or provocation that we are addressing. In this seminar, I will show you four examples of research methodologies relating to narrative design, taken from the point of view of four different disciplines, history and theory, landscape architecture, interior architecture, and architecture. The first research methodology we will discuss is by history and theory student, Adam Alexander. In his book, The Ontology of the Work of Art, philosopher Roman Ingarden argued that when writing his works, the novelist is free to a much higher degree than even the most independent architect. A whole realm of possibilities that are simply out of the question for the architect stands open to the writer's fantasy. As one example of narrative fiction, the award-winning French writer and filmmaker Alain Rogrier depicts his fictional worlds as a place where time is discontinuous and identity ambiguous. Thesis student Adam Alexander asked, is the realm of possibilities explored by Alan Rogrier truly out of the question for the architect? Adam proposed that Wellington's urban substations might provide an architectural response to this question. Adam's narrative design-led master's thesis titled In the Labyrinth Substations posed the following research question. As a challenge to Roman Ingarden's proclamation about the limitations of architecture, can Wellington's electrical substations simultaneously anomalous and anonymous, be reimagined and represented as unique architectural examples of Alan Robrey's fictional view of the modernist experience of reality. The following diagram represents Adam's methodology. Adam began by placing alpha and omega, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, at the start and finish of his methodology diagram. Over the letter alpha, he wrote Alan Robrey, and over the letter omega, he wrote substations. Adam's principal theorists were the psychologist Carl Jung and the philosopher Roman Ingarden. To represent these theorists, Adam placed the Greek letter psi, which is a symbol of psychology, onto his methodology diagram. Jung and Ingarden were contemporaries of Rogrier, and like Rogrier, they examined human perception in relation to the subliminal, the imagination, and the unconscious, but from the point of view of two different disciplines, psychology and philosophy. Adam's principal case studies were Wellington's substations, which he saw as architectural examples of the subliminal, the imagination, and the unconscious. In addition to substations, Adam investigated Mithraeums, underground early Roman temples that Carl Jung believed were related to the unconscious. Adam also investigated the Casa Malaparte by architect Alberto Libera, which Alain Rogrier used as the architectural set for his film Le Mépris, which he created in collaboration with filmmaker Jean-Luc Godard. The critical selection of multidisciplinary theorists and architectural case studies enabled Adam to critically interrogate relationships between the literature of Rogrier 
and the substation architecture of Wellington. During the first phase of the investigation, Adam's methodology diagram looked like this. But after drilling down, Adam's methodology diagram evolved much further. Adam discovered that the disciplines of film and fine art also played important roles in his findings. Rob Gourier collaborated extensively with filmmakers Alan Resnay and Jean-Luc Godard. He also collaborated extensively with artists René Magritte, Jasper Johns, and Robert Rauschenberg. In turn, artists Cy Twombly and Janet Cardiff were strongly influenced by the writings of Alan Rob Gourier. Throughout the evolving methodology diagram, Adam continually added notes to explain the relationships between these different disciplines. During the development of his methodology diagram, Adam critically interrogated the narrative processes of Alan Robguier's novel In the Labyrinth and Alan Robguier's film Last Year at Marienbad. His ultimate methodology diagram drew directly from the interrogation of the novel, the film, and his thesis proposition. The diagram provided a clear sequential pathway for a multi-layered narrative research investigation, enabling Adam to explore the subliminal in relation to Wellington's substations through the combined disciplines of literature, film, fine art, and architecture. Landscape architecture student Brad Dobson proposed that the name of his research site, The Forgotten World, implies a strong narrative that can be used to help generate the site's rehabilitation. The abandoned region called the Forgotten World once hosted a thriving town center with surrounding farmsteads, uniquely representative of pioneer rural New Zealand. But characterized by plates of abandonment, the Forgotten World has now almost reverted back to the wilderness state that it was trying so hard to subdue. Many of the man-made elements within the site are now overgrown, and these final reminders of the site's rich history are destined to be lost forever. Brad's narrative design-led master's thesis titled The Forgotten World posed the following research question. How can the formation of new landscape infrastructure facilitate future growth and active renewal of abandoned rural townships by building upon, rather than removing, the elements of abandonment and decay that represent their historical context and identity? Brad proposed that a landscape can be conceived as a place that is between places, and it is the journey through the ambiguous landscape to those places that reveals the true nature of the area as a whole. During the first phase of the investigation, Brad's methodology drew upon Arnold Van Gennep's journey-based theory of the rites of passage to ensure that the in-between nature of a hiking trail being always between fixed points will have narrative structure. Van Gennep's procession theory looks at experiential journeys as rites of passage that transcend from the profane to the sacred. He believed a rite of passage, which starts with a point of separation from the mundane and transcends through a liminal dimension to a place of incorporation, is capable of generating a greater sense of connection to the area. Brad began by creating a methodology diagram that articulated points of separation and incorporation on his site, represented by the existing landscape and abandoned man-made features. During the second phase of the investigation, Brad drilled down further, and his methodology diagram interrogated Van Gennep's theory in relation to nine critical landscape perspectives, sense of place, curating experience, pathway and pause, narrative and procession, epiphanies, liminal movement, semiotics, and mnemonics, the value of runes, mnemonic landscape architecture of the senses, and designing for the senses. This phase of the methodology was used to explore how to achieve a heightened narrative and enhance connections to place identity. During the third phase of the investigation, Brad drilled down even further. For the critical perspective curating an experience, Brad proposed that museum curation can be interrogated and successfully applied to the discipline of landscape architecture. By curating an element, viewers are made aware of it as an important element within a narrative setting even if it would otherwise appear as ordinary in a non-curated setting. Brad proposed that by curating the rusted tractors and dilapidated farm sheds characterizing the site, people will come to recognize them as meaningful. The act of curating can transform the ordinary into the extraordinary. For this phase, Brad interrogated Laura Hanks' 
eight principal devices for museum curation, meta-narrative and metaphor, plot and pace, a beginning, middle, and end, history and biography, characterization, persona, identity, and self. Brad integrated these eight theoretical devices into design experiments that sought to curate existing features of the landscape with new landscape interventions to help them attain recognition as curated elements. Brad's interrelated methodology diagrams together provided a clear sequential methodology pathway for a multi-layered narrative research investigation. Interior architecture student Erica Kruger based her narrative design-led master's thesis on a quote by Arden Reed in his article, Signifying Shadow. Reed wrote, we don't simply see shadows, we read them. That is, shadows inevitably signify because they are at once and inseparably sensory phenomena and cultural constructs. They carry, for example, a long history and a mythology. Erica's thesis considered how this quote could be interpreted by interior architecture. She proposed that the ability of shadows to promote subjectivities, to be narratively read as cultural constructs tied to a long history and a mythology, has been overlooked in interior architecture. Erica's narrative design-led master's thesis titled The Black Box, The Concealed Room posed the following research questions. How can drawing take on the fundamental role of communicating the interior of architecture through the language of the shadow? How can interior architecture establish specific objects and spatial relationships that are a result of the interpretation of the shadow and express that shadow's typology? Erica framed her methodology as five projects, each a concealed room stripped bare of its contextual architecture. As a narrative-led research thesis, Erica proposed a different fictional inhabitant for each of five fictional interior settings. She began by creating a methodology diagram that assigned 10 related attributes of the five stories she planned to tell. Time of night, occupant, type of space, mode of drawing technique, text, shadow condition, vehicle, light source, color, and temperature. For each story, the category text represented her principal theorist and the category vehicle represented her principal architectural case study. Project one was a gateway. Its fictional inhabitant was a deviant and the time of the narrative was sunset. Project two was a theater. Its fictional inhabitant was a vampire and the time of the narrative was 9 p.m. Project three was a bridge. Its fictional inhabitant was a paranoid schizophrenic and the time of the narrative was midnight. Project four was a memorial. Its fictional inhabitant was a ghost and the time of the narrative was 4 a.m. Project five was an art gallery. Its fictional inhabitant was an artist and the time of the narrative was sunrise. During the first phase of the investigation, Erica's methodology diagram looked like this. But in the second phase of the investigation, Erica's methodology diagram evolved much further into five methodology diagrams, each critically interrogating the 10 related attributes of the five stories she planned to tell. Methodology diagram B drilled down on the first three of the 10 attributes, time of night, occupant, and type of space. Methodology diagram C drilled down on the next three of the 10 attributes, mode of drawing technique, text, and shadow condition. Methodology diagram D drilled down on the next three of the 10 attributes, vehicle, light source, and color. Finally, methodology diagram E drilled down on the final attribute, temperature. In the third phase of the investigation, Erica developed five additional methodology diagrams, one for each fictional inhabitant of her five fictional interior settings, the deviant, the vampire, the paranoid schizophrenic, the ghost, and the artist. These 10 diagrams together provided a clear sequential methodology pathway for a multi-layered narrative research investigation, enabling Erica to explore the shadow anthropomorphically as a living inhabitant of interior architecture. Architecture student Mei Mio Min, who was born in Burma, based her narrative design-led master's thesis on a poem by Burmese poet Zaire Lin called my history is not my history. An excerpt from the poem reads, it wasn't me who wrote my history. 
They have written it for me, those academics. They have written their own versions. What they have written were mythologies sprinkled with gold dust. They have written my history. Then they have airbrushed me from history. My history has just begun. May's thesis considers how, with the advent of globalization, Eastern culture is rapidly losing much of its identity with the influx of Western ideals. She believes that the unique cultural heritage that is seen in ritual symbolism and cultural narratives adds an important sense of cultural identity that may soon be lost forever. May proposes that architecture can play a role in enabling these unique cultural aspects to be retained and unveiled for the next generation. Her thesis focuses on superstitions of the people of Asia and her personal identity as a Burmese New Zealander. It argues that computer gaming can reawaken concepts of time and cultural narrative in unique ways that especially appeal to a younger generation. May's narrative design-led master's thesis, titled My History is Not Mine, posed the following research question. How can architecture engage the younger generation of the 21st century in ways that reintroduce them to the fundamental essence of their own unique cultural narratives? May began by creating a methodology diagram that described nine superstitions from her grandmother. Each one was unraveled as a mask, a superstition, a theme, and an architectural theme. During the first phase of the investigation, May's methodology diagram looked like this, and she interrogated each of her nine stories in relation to Jerome Bruner's 10 attributes of a successful fictional narrative. According to Bruner's article, The Narrative Construction of Reality, the events in a narrative construction are understood by the way they relate over time, rather than by their moment-to-moment -moment significance. And at the same time, a successful fictional narrative must enable agency, the presumption of choice. In order to make a narrative worth telling, it needs to include disruptions from the expected. Brunner refers to these as breaches from canonicity. These breaches invite innovation and lead people to see the ordinary in fresh ways. A successful narrative also needs to permit cultural negotiation, allowing us to interpret through our own culture's processes for negotiating meaning. May developed nine physical models and related drawings from the implications of the matrix. In the second phase of the investigation, May moved her nine architectural designs into a computer gaming environment where players have a personal choice as to how the spaces are experienced. To allow for agency or personal choice, May created a second methodology diagram, this one animated, to help her develop the second phase of the investigation. This diagram was designed explicitly to invite moments of disruption and witness the repercussions of unexpected spatial player relationships. As the methodology diagram moved through different iterations, May mapped the movements and tracked their implications in her computer gaming environment. May's static and animated methodology diagrams together provided a clear sequential methodology pathway for a multi-layered narrative research investigation, enabling May to explore the interpretation of ritual superstitions as architectural environments, allowing each player to embark upon a unique journey of their own. Each of these four methodologies interrogated narrative design from the point of view of one or more principal narrative theorists. The first theorist, Roman Ingarden, discussed the narrative requirements for architecture to be understood as a work of art. The second theorist, Laura Hanks, unveiled how curated objects can be understood as a compelling narrative sequence, enabling the ordinary to be understood as extraordinary. The third theorist, Penelope Herlambidu, argued for the importance of allegorical narrative as a critical method. And the fourth theorist, Jerome Bruner, proposed essential conditions for the construction of reality in narrative fiction. Each student developed matrices derived from the theorist's narrative principles and devices. The discoveries arising from each successive matrix were then used to drill down further, which resulted in additional matrices. Each matrix in the sequence was used to develop sets of iterative design experiments, and the final design outcome was the result of the combined experiments.